Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Twenty-two minutes before ten o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this Thursday morning. Hope you're doing well. I got a, a quick story I want to tell you about a, um, a visit to New York. Now you know I grew grew up in New York, right? Oh, yeah. So I went back to New York one time years ago, and uh, my friend and I we got into the back of a cab and we told the the driver where we wanted to go, and uh, he started going away. I, I was like, "Why are we going this way?" You know. So I said to my friend, "This this is not the right way," and he said. No, this guy. These guys know. They're they're professionals. They know what they're doing. I said, no, no, uh, Jeff. I've been here. This I, I I know how to get where we're going. This looks like we're taking the wrong way. So I says, no, no, and I don't say anything to me. They don't even speak English. I said, well, this, they, they must. Oh. It was one of those. Yeah, one of those moments. Jeez. It was a Seinfeld moment. So anyway, I said, excuse me, excuse me. Are you sure this is the way? Oh yes, I know where I'm going. I I, I don't think so. Anyway, he he was a nice guy, and uh, we were right. Well, I was right. Uh-huh. I was right, in other words. I, I questioned the professional. Yeah. And uh, so, but, but but why was I so brave with a, with a taxi cab driver and I'd be so timid with a doctor? Is it because a doctor, because I don't know what he, a, I don't know what a doctor knows. See, I knew the streets of the city, mm-hmm. but I did not know, I don't know what a doctor knows. So I'd be really hard pressed to say to a doctor, are you sure that's cancer? You know, are you sure we yeah. should do this? Um, uh, Dr. Stephen Hatch has an interesting book, and, and uh, boy, he's, uh, it's a wonderful book to read. It's called Snowball in a Blizzard, A Physician's Notes on Uncertainty in Medicine. And uh, in all due respect to all the doctors, I guess this is almost impossible to get it right every time. So it's not like you would do anything intentionally wrong. And I don't even know that our driver was doing anything intentionally wrong. Maybe that's just the way he knew. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Hatch is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He's there right now, right, Robin? Yeah, I believe so. He works in the Division of Infectious Disease and Immunology. Wow. Dr. Stephen Hatch, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you for having me on, Larry. Where are you right now? Um, sitting in my office in a very cloudy Worcester, Massachusetts. It's cloudy. All right. Well, it'll clear up. Don't worry. Either that or you yeah. can move to Florida. It's beautiful here. Well, today we happen to have a 70-degree day, which is unseasonable for March. But uh, you got a great yeah, voice. The... Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, so I use my, my taxi cab story as a way to try to set up the stage for what we're talking about. Uh, how accurate was that story in regards to... <laughs> It's just a perfect setup, um, in part because a taxi driver, like a doctor, has uh, a set of specific knowledge. They know the roads uh, that they travel better in most cases, but not all cases, than the people who go in the cabs. Sure. And sometimes, you know, that taxi cab driver really does know a way that you don't know how to get. Although in the case that you showed, it was one where you turned out to be right. And there's a lot of situations in which patients know more than their doctors about what's going on. And the doctors get anchored on a particular diagnosis, and then they become sort of resistant to evidence that filters in that should say, hey, it's time to reconsider and move on to a different diagnosis or a different treatment. And then finally, um, uh, although you were making a, a joke about the, the actual language spoken, doctors often don't speak in English. They speak in a highly, highly technical mm-hmm. language yeah, that yeah, becomes yeah. very difficult for patients to understand. And sometimes they don't even realize that yeah. patients don't know what they're talking about. And in my experience with doctors, it seems like doctors typically will say, we think that what it is, is. And so they're very cautious also about saying with absolute sh- certainty that they are sure un- un- until later on. And I'm guessing, to use my, my taxi uh, metaphor, if you were, as a doctor yourself, to go to a doctor, you mean you would be in a much better position to question a doctor than, than somebody like myself. I think that's generally true. I'm comfortable with the field of medicine. I know how doctors think. But oddly enough, and I relate this in the book, there was a situation where 
kind of it came right back on me as a family member of a patient who was very sick and doctors started kind of pushing me around oh, and really? because I didn't know the situation I didn't know the literature uh, I thought I, I kind of was back on my heels and then once I sat down and started reading the literature I felt like I was being sold a bill of goods but here's where I see uh, a, a reason to be cautious about this topic because I could imagine the person saying you know what next time I go to the doctor and they tell me I have cancer I'm, I'm gonna take herbs I'm just mm-hmm. I'm just I'm just gonna do what I've what I read in the, in the late night TV uh, infomercial you know th- this bottle of oil is gonna is gonna cure me I think we could take it too far the other direction too you know being so sure you know what I mean? We, we're uh, using the taxi cab thing again. Let's say I was in L.A. I wouldn't know one road from the other. So I, I, but I could say I did, and, I, and I'd be wrong. Right, and I think that, that we want to get away from a model in which doctors um, portray themselves as being overconfident in what they do. Um, because you do ultimately lead some patients into believing it's an either-or proposition that either doctors are completely right, and then once you see the crack in the facade, then they just turn away entirely. And I think that does explain, in, in certain part, the appeal of what people loosely call alternative medicine, which rejects a lot of uh, the baseline assumptions of what we do in the mainstream of the medical community. Yeah, is is there a, is there a big difference between the the diagnosing what's wrong, uh, the accuracy in that, in other words, and 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 uh, deciding what to do about it? It seems like that would have more variables. The, the the what to do about whatever. It seems like you'd be more accurate about what's actually wrong, uh, than and maybe the questions would be how to handle whatever the problem is. So it goes on a sort of test-by-test test and disease-by-disease disease basis. So it may be helpful here to like break it down into an actual uh, example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the title of the book, Snowball in a Blizzard, comes from a joke that radiologists have about interpreting screening mammograms. Uh, the joke is, is that it's so difficult to separate out what looks like uh, a breast cancer tumor from regular tissue it, that it's like almost as if you're trying to find a snowball in a blizzard. And that joke's been around in the in the field of radiology for decades. Because it's so small sometimes? And and that separating tissue, regular tissue from cancerous tissue on an x-ray is much harder than it looks. And it's not like just sort of seeing this big thing sort of waving out there like a flag saying, mm. here I am, I'm yeah. the cancer. And when you actually look at mammograms, and I've got a couple of pictures in the, uh, in the book, you, you can see how difficult it is, even without being a radiologist. And so that leads into the, the rather contentious issue of screening mammogram recommendations, which have been in the news now for really most of the last 10 years. And these different organizations come out with different guidelines, and the guidelines are competing, and there's been a lot of very heated language about... You know, should you start at 40? Should you start at 50? Should you do it every year? Should you do it every other year? And really, all of those technical differences are all related to the problem with interpreting a mammogram. And so what happens is mm-hmm. when, when radiologists look at those mammograms, sometimes they call cancers that aren't actually there. And then women can end up becoming, after a biopsy, sometimes diagnosed with a cancer that they don't have, and then they suffer harm, even though we also know that we catch cancers that are really there. And so the guidelines are trying to balance Mm -hmm. the benefits of catching cancers early with the risks of catching women and giving them a diagnosis of a cancer that they don't have. Really? Do you know what I'm wondering? It sounds like what you're saying is that it's a learning process for everybody, for the doctors and and for society at, at, at large. And that we are evolving in the medical field, and and, and we're all—I mean, every one of us who is a patient—is in a way a, a teaching tool. I mean, um, you, you're going to learn from me. You're going to learn from Robin. You're going to learn from every patient you have, and 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 I think that's how it evolves. It, I think it changes it, it. What you just described changed the way doctors approach prostate cancer because now sometimes they don't even remove it because they say, "Well, ah, you're already 80." You're going to die anyway. You're going to die first of something else, so, right? Yeah, right, right. 
<laughs> not just not just that, but that if we try to go and treat that cancer, we may actually hasten your death. We actually may make things worse. The uh, the prostate cancer screening is actually an example where over about the last 20 years we've discovered that there's almost no benefit or no benefit at all, but that we're exposing a lot of men to risk. What makes mammograms more difficult is that study after study shows that there is a life-saving benefit, but then there are also mm-hmm. harms that come with it. Wow. Uh, we need to take a little break, and uh, we'll be right back. I do have a copy of the book, Snowball in a Blizzard. At the end of the interview, I will offer it. Don't call right now for the free one, but you are welcome to call to ask questions. Uh, and then we'll also find out how to buy the book itself. We'll take that break right now and be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. There's a high risk of rip currents at the beaches for the rest of the week. Sunshine mixing with clouds Thursday, breezy and warm, high 80 at the coast, 86 inland. Partly cloudy Thursday night, low 59 inland, 65 along the coast. For Friday, a mix of clouds and sun, high 79 on the coast, 85 inland. Saturday, partly sunny, maybe a shower, high 78 to 82. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Central Florida Eye Institute is the area's leader in laser vision correction. From high-definition refraction surgery and LASIK vision correction to custom cataract, glaucoma, and diabetic treatment, you can count on Dr. Crowley and his effective, friendly staff to provide you with the quality care you deserve. Call 352-237-8400 for an appointment or more information. That number again is 352-237-8400. Looking forward to service your vision needs. Robin, let's try a little plant trivia. Name this nursery. It's a not-for-profit, and it teaches growing and caring for plants to their students. Oh, that's easy. Kenny's Place. Or how about this one? It's a nursery conveniently located between Ocala and Bellevue. Again, it's Kenny's Place. Or how about this one? A nursery with a wide variety of just what you need or want at the most reasonable prices. Kenny's Place, of course. Kenny's Place at 7677 Southeast 41st Court. Give them a call at 867-1213. It's a caring place for people and plants. It's Kenny's Place. Ocala's premier active adult community has done it again. On Top of the World introduces Indigo East, our newest single-family homes designed for the way active adults live from just $149,990. You're hearing this correctly, brand new homes from just $149,990. Join us on March 12th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. and see these five all-new amazing floor plans for yourself. This is your chance to own a new two- or three-bedroom, two-car garage, single-family home from $149,990. That includes granite countertops in your kitchen and baths, LED lighting throughout, a Whirlpool appliance package, and too many energy-saving features to mention. Don't miss out on this incredible event at Indigo East by On Top of the World. March 12th only, visit our new Sales and Model Center. Take State Road 200 west of I-75 right on Southwest 80th Avenue. Or visit us online at ontopoftheworld.com. That's on top of the world.com. Restrictions apply. Subject to change without notice. See a sales counselor for full details. Equal housing opportunity. All right. Nine minutes before 10 o'clock. This is a fascinating conversation. Uh, but well, before we go back to our guest, uh, Dr. Thomas Crowley is one of the sponsors of this portion of AM Ocala Live. Dr. Crowley is a board certified ophthalmologist. He's with Central Florida Eye Institute, not too far from where we broadcast here at the Paddock Mall. And uh, that's where you can go for all of your eye care needs, whether it's something as serious as LASIK surgery, corneal transplants or something as simple as an eye exam and eyeglasses uh, they can do it all at the Central Florida Eye Institute. The location is 3133 Southwest 32nd Avenue and their phone number is 237-8400. Check their website out. It's centralfloridaeye.com And on the phone Dr. Stephen Hatch up in um, Massachusetts. His his book is called Snowball in a Blizzard. If you've been listening he's, he's giving us information that empowers us really and maybe makes us a little, a little more uh, courageous in questioning a, a doctor's prognosis or diagnosis i don't even know the difference between those two words that's how mm-hmm. low i am on this uh, on the scale but you know what i was thinking during the break doctor we're always told to get a second opinion so isn't that where we uh, where we have a little bit of uh, of leverage where we can say you know what i don't i don't doubt the doctor but i'm going to question him enough to go get a second doctor to look at this i think what's so first of all i think um Patients should always feel comfortable about getting a second opinion if they don't feel comfortable. Some of it has to do with the comfort level that you have uh, with your with your physician yeah. and yeah. your ability to converse with them less so than the need in every single case to go get a second opinion. Um, the What's important in 
second opinions, and uh, it re- relates to how how high the stakes are and how certain you can be about a treatment plan. So, for instance, getting a second opinion in a situation where you've been diagnosed with an unusual cancer or with a cancer where there are a variety of different treatment options, that's the kind of a situation where I think a second opinion makes perfect sense. If you have, in my field, uh, I have patients who present with chronic fatigue and they go around to a lot of different doctors and I always tell them it's entirely appropriate to get a new set of eyes to look on them because every now and again you're going to find a doctor who's just going to be able to put the information together in a slightly different way Mm -hmm. and maybe be able to come up with a diagnosis that nobody had ever considered before. So second opinions and being able to understand the reasoning that doctors have I think are really critical to a healthy relationship that patients can have, not just with a a given doctor, but with the whole system. And you have to have that form of communication open between doctor and patient because like uh, earlier, uh, since the uh, web is out there, it's easier to find out information and it's easier for the person to try to self-diagnose and maybe come into the doctor with a preconceived notion of what is ailing that person. Yeah, I think the internet has really changed the playing field between doctors and patients, neither for the good nor the better, it's just changed it and there's there's advantages to having the internet and disadvantages. One thing that's different about what I do now than what a doctor 50 years ago did because of the internet is that patients can look up the treatment disease and in occasional cases be more up to date than I am on a given disease at a given moment if they've done all the research the night before about an unusual disease. Uh, Whereas 50 years ago, I had the knowledge that was the, the, the thing that doctors possessed. So now, what, what I do have that most patients don't is I have context hardwired. Mm-hmm. I've seen lots of different patients with lots of different kinds of disease, so I can interpret a string of symptoms and maybe some lab tests in a way that's different from exactly that kind of patient that you talk about who comes in and they know that they have some disease because they read it on the Internet. Sometimes oh, they may yeah. be mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. but not always. And sometimes I try to have a conversation with them and say, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be that. Do we do it the uh, in, in uh, another way? Do we or should we? Um, let me see if I can explain what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so so far we've been talking about questioning a doctor's negative diagnosis. Uh, what about a positive diagnosis? What if you say, "Gosh, I know that I've got something wrong," and the doctor says, "No, you got nothing. There's nothing wrong." I, I had this happen to me, actually, believe it or not, uh, and, and it was nothing serious, but my knee was hurting horribly. And, yeah. and I went to have these doctors looking at it, and I, I think, this was when I was a kid, so they probably said, oh, he just wants time off of work. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I didn't, absolutely. My knee was, and Robin knows my knee was killing me because yeah. I couldn't climb stairs without being in excruciating pain. But they said, no, there's nothing wrong. And I, and I knew there was, but I, I, just, I just let it go, and then eventually it went away, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. But I guess it didn't show up in the x-rays and whatever else they did. Right. So first of all, thank you for reminding me about painful knees. That's uh, <laughs> as, I, as I creak around the hospital today, I'm going to be thinking about how you reminded me of. Oh, it. you have a painful knee? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, going up the stairs is not a lot of fun. But I have, I've been avoiding doctors about it. <laughs> right um, in in my field, uh, what I see a lot of patients who are who you describe are patients who have chronic fatigue syndrome. And particularly up here in Massachusetts where there's a lot of awareness about Lyme disease, a lot of these patients come in and they're like, doc, I've got Lyme disease. And then we look at the testing and the testing would indicate that they don't have Lyme disease. Oh, really? And Lyme disease testing is, is, I spend a whole chapter talking about that because the tests are in particular instances not very good, but the longer you have symptoms, the more reliable the test becomes. So if you've been having symptoms for six months and a Lyme disease test is negative, I can say with a pretty high degree of certainty that that means that you don't have Lyme disease. But what I'm very careful to do in a situation like that is to say, say, well, while it may not be Lyme disease, I validate what's going on with you right now, and I believe Mm -hmm. what you're saying when you say you're wiped out. And I think that doctors sometimes confuse negative tests as evidence that nothing exists. 
So yes. what I would have tried to say if I had been, you know, evaluating your knee at the time is to say, I don't know what, what's going on with your knee. The tests are coming up negative, but it doesn't believe. It doesn't mean I believe that you're making it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, this was fascinating. Let me give the book away. It's called Snowball in a Blizzard. It, we didn't even scratch the surface. Uh, let me tell you this, listeners. This is a great book. A Physician's Notes on Uncertainty in Medicine. If you would like the copy that was sent to us, it's a hardcover book. Stephen Hatch is who you will look up. S-T-E-V-E-N-H-A-T-C-H. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. Doctor, do you have a website you can direct us to? Yeah, so you can either Google Basic Books, and they have a website with a link on it. Also, you can go directly to www.snowballinablizzard, that's all one word, dot com, and on that, you can actually give me direct feedback. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, well, thank you for doing this. Take care of that knee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go see a doctor and have them tell me that there's nothing wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, funny stuff. Uh, by the way, during the commercial, I was just curious. Were you listening to the prices of the houses down here? Aren't they great prices? Yeah, well, I live in the Boston area. I work in Worcester, <laughs> but, you know, so. You could live like a king down here. I could exactly. probably buy three houses for what I pay for my little I'm, my little one up here. I'm sure you could. Thank you, doctor. All right, we'll be right back. <laughs> Thanks very much. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Fox News Radio, I'm Lillian Wu. Flash flood watches from Texas to Illinois in North Louisiana, some 3,500 homes to be evacuated.